Hello, and welcome to today's America Walks webinar on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. This is the second webinar in our two-part Walking Towards Justice in Indian Country series. My name's Ian Thomas, State and Local Program Director with America, and managing the webinar technology today is my colleague, Kelsey Card, Operations Development and Video Manager. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, without whom these webinars would not be possible. They are the Everybody Walk Collaborative, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and their Active People Healthy Nation Project, the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, MIG, and Better Help. Before I introduce today's topic and guest moderator, I want to let you know that closed captioning is available under the tab marked questions in your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you have questions or comments for our expert panelists, please type them into the box in that same area. We will address as many as we can during the discussion portion of the webinar and then post additional responses on the web page with the recording. As I mentioned, today's webinar is the second in a two-part series titled Walking Towards Justice in Indian Country. As you may recall, Walking Towards Justice is our occasional webinar format in which we take a racial, economic, or social justice issue and explore the ways in which injustices against specific groups intersect with walking and walkability. And we often, often accompany these webinars with a group read activity of a relevant book or books. Uh, a little more about that coming shortly. Back in June, we broadcast the first webinar in this series, which focused on tribal transportation planning and pedestrian safety. The panel discussed the shocking fact that American Indians and Alaska Natives are killed while walking at a rate almost five times higher than the average American. And they identified roads designed for speeding, jurisdictional issues and poor communication between tribal and non-tribal government agencies, and the continuing legacy of European colonialism among the causes. Today, we address the equally tragic injustice of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which also targets people walking and has evolved from many of the same problems. To tell us more and introduce today's panel, I'm delighted to welcome Margot Hill, today's guest moderator. Margot, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Margot Hill is the director of the Eastern Washington University Tribal Planning Program and an expert on the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. A member of the Spokane tribe, Margot has worked extensively in the legal field, protecting tribal sovereignty, providing legal counsel to tribal counsel, and assisting in the revision of tribal law and order codes. She holds a Juris Doctorate from the University of Gonzaga School of Law and a Master's of Urban and Regional Planning from Eastern Washington University. Margot, thank you so much for moderating our webinar today. And over to you. Heyo putis in kasiku, putis in kweli, putis lichla. Luis Quest, Margot Hill. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Margot Hill, and it is my honor to facilitate this webinar today. America Walks is hosting this important discussion on missing and murdered indigenous women because it involves walking and mobility and transportation. All women, and we will talk about uh, specifically indigenous women, have the right to travel safely. Walking to your destination should not subject you to violent acts or even death. This is part two, as Ian mentioned, of our walking towards justice in Indian country we will discuss access and equity challenges facing indigenous people in today's North America, namely the United States and Canada. We invite you to see our first webinar that discuss pedestrian safety and the legal and jurisdictional issues that, that face Indian country. Next slide, please. Murdered and missing women is an important issue in our nation. The National Crime Information Center reports that 
5,712 uh, reports of missing American Indians and Alaska Native women and girls. This is the NCIC. The Federal Bureau of Investigation collects these statistics. The U.S. Department of Justice missing person database at the same time, name us, only logged 116 cases. We clearly have a breakdown of our systems, of our data, in reporting our missing indigenous women. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has reported that murder is the third leading cause of death for indigenous women. The rates of violence on some of our reservations can be up to 10 times higher than the national average. The Urban Indian Health Institute uh, reporting these uh, statistics and numbers uh, cited the National Institute of Justice and actually looked at the death certificates of indigenous women. We wanna pause and take a moment in our tribal way to provide an honor song um, for our indigenous women. I have asked my cousin, uh, my little cousin, Isaac Tenasket, a member of the Spokane tribe, to share with us a song that he has uh, created uh, for MMIW. Isaac Tenasket. <clears throat> process for our tribal communities. Um, Isaac uh, created this song uh, and was moved to share it with us. And so I thank my little cousin uh, from the Spokane tribal people that shared this song. Today, uh, we are going to talk about uh, murdered missing indigenous women and the causes. Um, Ian, if you could share the mobility slide, please. As part of an understanding uh, murdered missing indigenous women, the Seattle Urban Indian Health Institute did a report um, identifying some of the major urban areas and large cities where murdered, where indigenous women go missing and are murdered. These are some of the top 10 cities across our nation. This is not just a reservation problem, but it is also a part of our urban cities and our transportation systems. Next slide, please. It is the dark side of history and colonization, the forced removal of Native Americans in the United States, federal Indian policy, Supreme Court cases, led tribal communities to be disrupted. We were forced onto reservations and then later pushed out into urban cities as part of a goal of assimilation and termination. These federal policies distort our natural sediment patterns and disrupt, disrupt our tribal community connections, breaking down our family and tribal systems. These pose special challenges for law enforcement, 
and for U.S. attorneys that are obligated to prosecute these crimes under the Major Crimes Act. We will discuss some of those issues today with our panelists. Um, next slide, please. Missing and murdered indigenous women implicates mobility and safe travel for women and involves all aspects of transportation, buses, truck stops, highways, and pedestrian safety. Traffickers use our transportation systems and highways and airports and shipping ports to commit these illegal acts. It is our responsibility as transportation planners and good communi community members to work towards solutions for safe travel. So we thank you for joining us today to find more to find out more about this important issue. Next slide, please. As part of this Walking Towards Justice Indian Country, we have highlighted three authors, Louise Eldridge, The Roundhouse, uh, a great read, I encourage you to look at it, uh, Highway of Tears by Jessica McDerryman, uh, an author that will be joining us today to provide us valuable insight and give voice to our indigenous women and Katsitanak, um, our missing and murdered indigenous sisters, uh, uh, edited novel uh, or uh, edited uh, series of essays. And we also have uh, author, uh, Dr. Laura Harjo that will be joining us in our discussions today. Last slide, please. Today, we are very pleased uh, to present our panel. We have the honorable US Congresswoman, Deborah Holland, uh, uh, an enrolled member of the Pueblo Laguna tribe joining us, and I will give uh, more detailed introductions, but just so we acknowledge everyone who's on the call today, we have Dr. Laura Harjo, a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation on the line with us, Jessica McDerm McDermott, um, author of Highway of Tears um, that's joining us, and also Karina Miller, a member of the Confeder Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs and a current candidate for the Oregon uh, Senate, uh, State Senate. So welcome to everybody on this panel. We want to begin um, by giving a voice to the indigenous women who have gone missing. And so I is with it is my pleasure to introduce Jessica McDermott. Uh, Jessica is going to tell us a little bit and share a little bit about um, her book but also um, name and uh, reference specific individuals and family members that she interviewed for her book, Highway of Tears. Jessica is a Canadian journalist who has worked across North America and Africa, writing publications such as the, for publications such as the Toronto Store, Star, the Associated Press, um, the Canadian Business and Harvard Review, her book, Highway of Tears, is a true story of racism, indifference, and the pursuit of justice for murdered, missing Indigenous women and girls. Jessica, please. Thanks so much, Margot. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to today share, start off by sharing a story of one of the girls who was murdered on the Highway of Tears. Um, so the Highway of Tears is a 450 mile stretch of road in Northwest British Columbia. It's a remote area. It's a 12 to 16 hour drive north of Vancouver. And the entire region is home to only maybe a couple of hundred thousand people. Uh, that's combining all the communities. And for decades, essentially since this highway was built in the 1950s, Indigenous women and girls have been going missing and being found murdered along it and in the communities that it connects. Uh, and so it's really an honor for me today to tell you about one of these girls, Ayla Sarek Oje. Oh. So, Ayla was raised in Edmonton. Her mom, Audrey, had grown up on a reserve in northern Alberta, uh, where she had been placed in an abusive foster home because her own mother was struggling with the trauma of residential school and had been forced to give her up. When Audrey was in her late teens uh, and starting a family, she moved to Edmonton to make a new life, a good life for herself and her kids. Uh, so Ayla was the youngest of five kids. 
this is her on the left. This is her when she was about two. And those boots are her sister Sarah's boots. So every morning when Sarah would be running out the door to go to school, Ayla would steal her winter boots and not give them back. And the kids were really close. They went everywhere together. They adventured everywhere. Ayla really loved animals. She brought home every animal she could find. This is her with a puppy when she was four. Uh, and so her brother, Tim, used to always say, this house is like a freaking zoo because she would have so many, uh, so many of her little friends running around. And this is uh, Ayla on the left with her sister, Kyla, brother, Tim, and some of their nephews. And this is Audrey, Ayla's mom. So Audrey moved the family from Edmonton to Prince George, which is a small city that is the Eastern gateway to the Highway of Tears in about 2004, after a neighbor had uh, sexually abused Ayla and they just wanted to get away to a new place, to a different place. Audrey felt like a smaller city would be safer and it would be a better place for the kids. When they arrived in Prince George, they found a little place on the edge of the city where there was bears and deer wandering through the yard. They were finally out in nature for the first time in their life. Ayla did really well at her local school. She was a helper for all the, the kindergarten little kids. This is her on her grade seven graduation from that school with the most improved student award. Uh, and then they moved across town and she started high school. They celebrated Christmas in 2005 and a couple days later, it was Ayla's 14th birthday. And so one of her sisters made her an angel food cake and the other did her hair and her mom gave her a necklace. And in February 2006, Ayla went to the mall with her brother, her sister, and a few friends. Now, over the course of that night, she got separated from them. When she didn't come home, her mom went to the police, who said to give it uh, a couple days. And so Audrey went searching herself, walking up and down every street of the city, calling out for her daughter. About a week later, somebody driving along the highway spotted something in the ditch. The police showed up at the family home with a necklace. And it was a necklace they'd found with the body, and it was the only thing found with the body. It was the one Audrey had given Ayla for her birthday. This is a memorial on the side of the highway where Ayla was found. So after that, Ayla's family split apart. The kids went and stayed with extended family, and Audrey went back to Edmonton where she spent years on the street, addicted and devastated. It just destroyed her for, for some years. Uh, but along the way, she she found her way by starting to do walks. And so she would walk the Highway of Tears and other highways to raise awareness about the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls for Ayla and also for the thousands of others. And then in 2013, Audrey was killed in a car accident on the same highway. And Ayla's siblings continue to struggle and they continue to work to try and keep Ayla's memory alive and to try and keep this issue alive and more than anything to find answers for what happened to Ayla. This case is still unsolved. And Ayla is just one of dozens of women and girls that have gone missing and been murdered on that remote stretch of highway. This is a map of the Highway of Tears here. Uh, so you can see Prince George on the, the eastern side out to Prince Rupert. These are the names of some of the others missing and murdered from the Highway of Tears. There's 21 names here in front of you, the earliest from the 1970s and the, the most recent from just last year. But this is by no means a complete list of the women and girls missing from just that stretch of road. These are only unsolved cases. And even then it's not complete. Uh, there is no official list for this area in Canada or for Canada in general. Uh, and then to put it in perspective, this is a map of North America and the, the little circle there shows the geographic area that roughly is the highway of tears. So as you can see, it's a minuscule piece of a vast, vast continent. And what's happening there is happening everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for giving a voice to our Indigenous women. It is now my pleasure to introduce Laura Harjo. Laura, Dr. Harjo is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, 
and Associate Professor of, of Native American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Previously, she was an Associate Professor at University of New Mexico School of Architecture and Planner, Planning. She teaches Indigenous Planning and Community Development. Dr. Harjo's research and teaching centers on imbuing complexity to Indigenous space and place, missing and murdered Indigenous women and relatives, and community-based knowledge production. She is the author of Spiral to the Stars and co-authored with Dr. Heather Dory's Beyond Safety, Refusing Colonial Violence Through Indigenous Feminist Planning. Dr. Harjo has served as a Muscogee Creek Nations Ambassador to the United Nations and is currently the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Harjo, for joining us and please go ahead. Thank you, Margo, for the introduction. And thank you, Jessica, for that um, heart-wrenching story that you shared with us. So where I start from is really, um, one, I wanna talk about the structure of settler colonialism and how we find ourselves in this place with missing and murdered indigenous women. And I also wanna talk um, from the aspect of community since I work in community planning. So starting first with providing a little bit of cultural and historical context for this MMIW webinar. Um, so if we think about indigenous women, um, when we talk about them, they don't have humanity until they're missing or we've lost them. And, you know, we see an ongoing um, process of this. So if we sort of roll back and we look at settler colonialism and the logics of elimination, there's a need to eliminate the indigenous people that are on the land to afford um, settlement of European settlers. And so that was sort of like the first wave. And so like, you know, you see the trail of tears, um, Andrew Jackson, like there's this devaluing of indigenous bodies as well that goes along with the elimination of the native. So Andrew Jackson and um, his soldiers, they actually made um, bridles and reins for Andrew Jackson's horses out of Creek, the skin of Creek people. So you see this devaluing of indigenous bodies early on. But um, because English common law is really based and privileges um, men, you see this shift in um, the structure of communities. And so where some communities were matriarchal, there's this imposition of heteropatriarchy and who has ownership and control over the land. And so with that sort of heteropatriarchy, some examples of that, you know, you see with the Dawes Act and how households were enumerated and the male was put as head of household. And even with the census, um, whoever kind of marks as head of household, if I'm, in, if I'm not correct, uh, that sets the race of the household. So that if you're um, in a household that's patriarchal and the patriarch of the house is not native, then that sets the house household as um, a non-indigenous household. So you sort of see this propagation of heteropatriarchy. Another aspect of this is um, the devaluing of indigenous women then. So uh, the piece of this is that by eliminating indigenous women, you eliminate social orders and political orders. So by eliminating women, you see it as sort of hollowing out of nations. And if we look at um, who's bearing children, who's doing the labor in the household, um, in the community, the labor of raising families, often it's by and large indigenous women. So there's this aspect of where, you know, indigenous women, don't have humanity unless they're dead. So I feel like that's an aspect that we really need to take on as well. Um, you know, and we also see this start out early in the schools with the overcriminalization of indigenous youth in the school system. Um, and you can look at stats on that. Some of it has to do with in-school arrest, out-of-school suspensions, 
some of it where there's um, a majority of indigenous students, there's an overrepresentation of indigenous students that are placed in special ed. And so that's so sort of setting the path for these students that they're not placed in a mainstream education because teachers don't wanna deal with them. So we see this sort of process of dehumanizing and devaluing of indigenous people, indigenous women, and some of the ways in which um, this operates further is also the over-representation of indigenous women in sex trafficking as well. So a report out of Minnesota on sex trafficking 72% of um, indigenous women were impacted by this that were part of the study. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's this overrepresentation of sexual violence in indigenous communities and overrepresentation of indigenous women um, in the prison system and subjected to um, violent crimes as well. So, all of this is interrelated. But one of the aspects to, that I really come to on this, okay, so if we're laying out this idea of like how violence starts, how it perpetuates, how it's a structure, how it's carried out in the schools, in the justice system, in the prisons, I come to this from like, how do community members embody power, that they're not looking to structures to liberate themselves. So what are liberatory aspects that communities can take on and empower themselves? And so um, some of the physical dimensions of design, some of, those are some of the ways that community planning has taken this on. Um, but from an indigenous feminist perspective, some of the other ways that we can think about is um, Eve's Tuck work and not looking at indigenous communities as damage centered another way that we can because when we when we look towards a damage centered narrative about community we begin to believe and embody these stories and they're not emancipatory they're not empowering to retell damage narratives about ourselves another aspect of um sort of feminist planning um interventions is around felt knowledge. So honoring, respecting this idea of felt knowledge. So, you know, I can talk later about this, but this sort of community participatory aspect of how communities can come together and sort out their ideas. So one aspect of this that um, I've worked with other colleagues on the past with is asking folks um, what's working in their community and what's not and these are indigenous communities around in violence against indigenous women and children. And so one of the things that kind of kept coming up was around law enforcement, that law enforcement didn't believe them or that it was political, like if it was um, tribal law enforcement, that they couldn't get somebody to come out because it was their brother or their cousin or whomever, and they didn't want to get their brother, cousin, or whatever in trouble. And so those are a few sort of interventions. And I can talk later too about um, maybe some of the city aspects of how indigenous communities are organizing and responding at a community level to MMIWG. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harjo, for your opening remarks. Next, I would like to introduce Karina Miller. Karina is a enrolled member of the Confederate, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, where she works for the Warm Springs Community Action Team. She is currently running for election to the Oregon State Senate to represent District 30. After winning the Democratic Party primary in May, Karina has always been passionate about her grassroots organizing and activism. Through her experiences in student unions and at the University of Oregon Senate, and the, United States, and the United States Student Association. In 2016, Karina was elected to the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Tribal Council, which as a treaty tribe calls for leaders to be well-versed in every area of governance. To lead sovereign nations, Karina has a strong tie to the land and her ancestors practiced subsistence fishing and hunting along the Columbia River and its tributaries. Karina, 
please give us your opening remarks. Miller. Hello, everybody. I am uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And my name is Karina Miller. Do you, would you just like me to go or did you just want me to do an introduction? Y yes, please go ahead. Okay. So um, I'm very honored to be here and I really, you know, it's very exciting listening to other speakers kind of talk about these issues and the ways that we can start addressing them in our communities and start dismantling some of them. And I was just hoping to build off some of that for the work that's taking place in Oregon. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Margo. And like you mentioned, I am from the Confederate Tribe of Warm Springs and so we're very unique in the sense that we are one of two treaty tribes in Oregon um, and we signed our treaty in 1855. We actually have the lar largest reservation here in Oregon but we uh, there's a law called Public Law 280 which is the state law and we are actually the, the state jurisdiction law and so Warm Springs is exempt from that <clears throat> and that allowed me to experience when I was on tribal council you know I haven't done the research or the um, the ability to talk about these stories as in-depth as I'd like but there were a lot of these cases where because of jurisdictional issues or because of systemic breakdown or just not really well thought out policy as far as how tribes operate when there are um, acts of violence against native women if right now what happens is if it is a native man of any tribe who carries out any sort of violence against a native woman, our, our, our jurisdiction is that we are allowed to arrest them and put them into the system. But if it is a non-native who perpetuates any sort of harm, we cannot do uh, criminal charges. We can only have jurisdiction from outside come in, obtain the person, take them to jail, and then pursue out of our court. And so even the ways that these systems are set up for us to be disempowered when it comes to violence against our women from outside communities, that needs to be dealt with. And even though Warm Springs is public law 280 exempt and we have established our own systems, the, these dysfunctional ways that these different policies, because we're federal nations work, is how our women slip through the cracks oftentimes. And, and we know now too, it's not just women, but there are there is a lot of violence against Native men as well. And so a big part of why I'm actually running for the legislature is because, you know, everything is intersectional. And that's important, I think, in missing and murdered Indigenous women in this work to understand what intersectionality means. It's not, you know, it really is identifying areas of our government or our societies that disproportionately impact specific groups. And so law enforcement, you know, what happened was in the state legislature, our, um, we have a native woman who is a state representative. Her name is Tana Sanchez out of Portland, and she worked on House Bill 2625. And this was to form a, a, a group to study this epidemic and why the state wasn't um, addressing it. And we really, I think what a lot of us are understanding in the, in the Indian country is that we know that these are issues. And we've studied federal policy and law, and we can see in black and white blatantly that policies were created for tribes to not exist into this century. And it's across the board. And so what we need to start doing is dismantling those specific systems and identifying the foundations of a lot of the law that exists today and understanding that there was white supremacy, there was racism, there was genocide taking place. And and that is why these laws trickle into this now. But what's happening is there's just not data being collected. I know when the bill was passed, there were 5,712 5, victims who had been identified as missing or murdered indigenous women, but only 116 of those were logged into a formal database. And that fact alone is just completely discouraging. And so instead of you know the bill rushing right to hear are the specific asks that we have to dismantle these systems, we recognize that the data just doesn't exist. And not only does the data not exist, but we're not centering these communities. And so what, what Representative Sanchez did in this bill was she created a work group to work within the Oregon State Police and to also do listening sessions within tribal communities, within each of the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon, but also within um, urban areas because we also, I think, are starting to recognize that we can't understand how policies are impacting people until we give people those spaces to advocate for themselves. So there's still a lot of work being done. A report has come out and there, um, there will hopefully be more bills passed to go 
more in depth about how we can reform some of these systems, but it all connects, it all connects and it all matters. So I hope, um, I am not going over my time. And again, I'm very honored to be a part of this call. And I thank America Walks for shining light on this. I know this is the second tribal focused um, issue. And, and I have to say, you know, I know we've, there's been some other conversations, but walkability and safety, especially um, in a lot of highways and a lot of areas like the map shown earlier, the Seattle area, a lot of us are mixed tribes and the Pacific Northwest is kind of my, my area, you know? And so it all connects and it's important. And I appreciate organizations who are stepping outside and, and giving voice to these issues. So, Poslani. Lum lunch, thank you, Karina. Uh, Karina shed some light on some very important uh, and complicated issues. Understanding jurisdiction in Indian country is very difficult. I can tell you as a tribal attorney, uh, uh, I had to deal with the uh, difficult jurisdictional issues and on our reservation lands. Um, so just briefly to understand why tribes don't have criminal jurisdiction over non-natives is because of a United States Supreme Court, court case called Oliphant, uh, divesting tribes of criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian offenders that come onto the reservation. It, this is very challenging for tribal communities. Also the Major Crimes Act uh, requires that uh, federal agencies come in. Um, the FBI are required to me, uh, investigate any major crimes. If it's murder, rape, arson, the, the FBI comes on into the reservation and does the investigation. And the U.S. Attorney's Office is also obligated to investigate those major crimes. I served as the tribal attorney for the Spokane tribe for a number of years. And it was very difficult sometimes working with outside federal agencies. And I received letters of declination uh, to prosecute those uh, major crimes that were happening with Indian country. So Karina brings up some great points. Um, and uh, it's really important that we look at how we're dealing with these jurisdictional issues on a national level. So next it is my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Congressman Deb Holland. Uh, she is a 35th generation New Mexican who is an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Laguna and also has Jemez Pueblo heritage. As a single parent, she lived paycheck to paycheck, relied on food stamps at times, and struggled to put herself through college. Nevertheless, she earned degrees from the University of New Mexico and the University of New Mexico Law School. After running for New Mexico Lieutenant Governor in 2014, Holland became the first Native American woman to be elected to lead a state Democratic Party. In 2018, she and Sharice Davids of Kansas, a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, became the first two Native American women to be elected to the United States Congress. Within her first few months, Congresswoman Deb Holland introduced the Not Invisible Act of 2019, designed to address the silent crisis of murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, the Honorable United States Congresswoman Deborah Holland. There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I am so honored to be on this panel with some amazing women. Uh, Jessica, your presentation just, um, it's so heartfelt. And I thank you for all the work you've done and just want to thank Karina for running. Thank you for running. We need more of our voices and more uh, Native women uh, to have a seat at the table. So I'm proud to be here on the America Walks webinar to speak with you on an issue that I'm passionate about, and that's missing and murdered Indigenous women crisis. I'd like to say a big thank you to the staff for all of your hard work uh, for in preparing for today's webinar. I understand the long hours that your team puts in um, to bring this information to the public, and I greatly appreciate your time. Before discussing some of the federal legislation that I've worked on this Congress um, for this crisis, I'd like to first note that the violence that Indigenous women face is not isolated only to this country. Uh, and I think Jessica uh, outlined that. Uh, it's plagued our indigenous sisters across North America in places like Canada and Honduras in, South, in countries like South America. 
Uh, the crisis is also not only isolated to women and girls, but severely impacts our two-spirit people and trans women. Uh, tr trans women of color are, are the most, um, um, they're the women who, who, are, who, who suffer uh, the highest amounts of assaults and murders. Uh, in Honduras, at least 97 transgender people have been murdered since 2009. In Guatemala, five transgender women were killed in only a five month period in 2017. In my district in Albuquerque, New Mexico, there have been three transgender Navajo members murdered within the last 10 years. These rates are likely much higher since law enforcement at the state and federal levels don't track victims' tribal affiliation. So this isn't recorded and the statistics are likely much higher. To fully comprehend this crisis, the historical context is critical to understand. Native American people in this country come from communities that have, have historically faced genocide, forced removal, and loss of resources that date back to the arrival of Columbus. This crisis has plagued Native communities since the late 1400s when Europeans uh, came here and inflicted hundreds of years of racism and genocide against our people, which of course included severely physical and sexual violence against Native women who continue to be sexualized in the media today. It's been a little over 500 years since this began, and we've seen this horrific narrative normalized in American culture through romanticized depictions of indigenous women like Pocahontas and Sacagawea, who were both repeatedly raped and impregnated by colonizers as teenagers. The evidence of this crisis is even hanging in plain view at the Capitol Rotunda. If you go to the rotunda in our nation's capital, you'll find life-size oil paintings that depict the so-called beginning of this country, that illustrates the ethnic cleansing and conquest of the colonizers through paintings of Christian baptisms and fearful naked native women running from Europeans when they arrive on our shores. On the same wall in the rotunda, you'll find a painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, a document that says, all men are created equal. However, only 30 lines below that, this founding document of our country refers to Native Americans as merciless Indian savages. And that is taken directly from the document. Unsurprisingly, there are no Native Americans or merciless Indian savages painted into this Declaration of Independence painting that's hanging in our nation's capital today. This painting was installed in 1826, which was 194 years ago. This shows just how long the missing and murdered indigenous women crisis has gone unnoticed in broad daylight in America. The importance of the symbolism of this artwork is even more significant because only two years after these paintings were installed in the rotunda, Andrew Jackson was elected as the US president. During his presidency, Andrew Jackson was successful in carrying out Thomas Jefferson's blueprint of cultural genocide of indigenous people in this country. Andrew Jackson, whom Trump also has an oil painting of hanging in his Oval Office right now, is credited with carrying out the Indian removal policy that led to the militarization of the Trail of Tears, one of the Native American genocides where our ancestors were marched over a thousand miles to be imprisoned in military camps where again, many of the women and children were also raped and murdered. To put all this history into perspective, it's been 243 years since the Declaration of Independence was signed, 230 years since the first United States Congress met, and 194 years since these paintings in the rotunda were hung. However, it's only been 20 months since my sister, Representative Sharice Davids and I were elected as the first Native American women to serve in the United States Congress. It's taken Native women over 240 years to finally hold a congressional seat in the United States government where we can finally advocate for the MMIW crisis so it doesn't continue to be silent any longer. In tribal communities, this crisis has never been silent. It has been passed down through generational trauma from many failed federal policies, genocide, and severe underfunding for basic public safety services on our reservations, nations, and pueblos. It's impacted many family members and friends, but little has been done over time 
to combat the issue. When I first decided to run for office, I did so with the intention of bringing much needed representation to Indian country and to the issues that have plagued our community since Europeans came here and subsequently inflicted those hundreds of years of violence against us, which of course included this crisis that we're all speaking about today. Whether or not you belong to a tribe, you likely know that Native American women are disproportionately affected by violence compared to any other demographic in the country. This is why I worked so hard to shed light on these issues and introduce legislation, this Congress, to bring healing to our communities. Among the most crucial pieces of legislation that I brought forward is the Not Invisible Act of 2019. The first bill introduced by four federally recognized tribal members, including Representative Davids, who is a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and myself, a member of Laguna Pueblo. This bill works to establish an advisory committee comprised of law enforcement, tribal leaders, survivors, and family members to address this harrowing epidemic to find jurisdictional solutions to the complex legal framework of tribal lands. Additionally, I helped introduce an updated version of Savannah's Act, which will work to address MMIW cases by increasing coordination and communication between state, federal, tribal, and local law enforcement agencies to improve the collection of data and statistics related to track missing indigenous people. My two most recent bills called the Badges Act and the Honoring Promises to Native Nations Act also work to solve these complex issues. I worked with Senator Udall, who's been a great advocate for Indian country and New Mexico on the Badges Act, which will streamline the BIA tribal officer hiring process, establish federal grants to combat the crisis and improve federal data sharing for missing and unidentified indigenous people. Similarly, Senator Elizabeth Warren and I are currently finalizing the Honoring Promises to Native Nations Act. This will be a comprehensive bill that follows the US Commission on Civil Rights Broken Promises Report to address the chronic underfunding in Indian country across all federal agencies. This legislation is significant because it aims to reaffirm the trust responsibility and specifically addresses the long-standing budgetary shortfalls that will bolster funding for public safety on tribal lands. Last, I was successful in moving another one of my bills, the Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Violence Act, out of committee earlier this year, along with the Not Invisible Act and Savannah's Act, which are all pending a vote on the House floor this fall. The Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Violence Act is, a crit is critical to restore tribal criminal jurisdiction to the domestic violence crimes of dating violence, sexual violence, and stalking. So tribes can have the authority to prosecute perpetrators who commit these specific crimes against Native women on our tribal lands. Each of the pieces of legislation that I've worked on since I've been in Congress shows that there's a critical need for tribes to gain access to basic public safety resources that other state and local governments are afforded. There's absolutely no reason why Native women and girls shouldn't have to fear that no one will act if something should happen to them. Tribal criminal jurisdiction and federal funding resources for Indigenous women and girls is quite literally a matter of life and death. It will take a profound and unanimous effort to dismantle this destructive cycle and corrosive narratives about Indigenous people in this country, but I'm hopeful that we'll see change in our lifetimes so we can create a better future for our young indigenous women and two-spirit people. As I wrap up, I'd like to leave you with some known statistics on gender-based violence against Native American women. And a question I'd like each of you to think about. Compared to the national average, Native women are four times more likely to be sexually assaulted. 50% have suffered from sexual violence, more than 80% have survived serious violence during their lives, and they are 10 times more likely to be murdered than any group of women in the country. 10 times more likely to be murdered than any other group of women. And most of these cases are ignored by authorities every single year. Think about this for a second. 
if 50% of any group of women living in a major American city, like Washington DC, where I happen to spend a lot of time, had been victims of sexual assaults and faced murder rates at 10 times the national average, what do you think the public response would be? Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak and I look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you so much. Lem Lunch, Lem Lunch Congresswoman Holland. Thank you for your engaging remarks. Now we would like to invite all of our panelists for a panel discussion. Um, and I have a few questions. Um, we will be taking questions from the audience members um, but let me just note one uh, for a point of clarification. If yes, if all of our panelists could turn on, um, there there was a question from uh, our our audience about uh, jurisdiction. Um, since I, I kind of explained that issue, I will go ahead and clarify. So tribes do have jurisdiction over tribal members and other Indians living on the reservation. So if they commit violent acts on the reservation in Indian country, they will in fact be arrested by tribal law enforcement and prosecuted. However, if, if it's a non-Indian, um, we do not have criminal jurisdiction because of all font. So it leaves a void, a lack of jurisdiction. Um, and we have to call our local county sheriff. Um, and depending on the county, some of our counties we work very well with um, and somebody shows up to arrest that perpetrator. Some counties don't show up. Last year at 4th of July, I know our chief of police made a phone call to a local county and on a domestic violence related issue and nobody showed up. So it's really frustrating in Indian country to have some perpetrators uh, that may go um, un unreported and unprosecuted uh, due to uh, the jurisdictional scheme in Indian country. Um, so I have, quite, I have a question uh, for Karina. Karina, you worked on the front lines with indigenous women in your tribal communities, and you understand kind of the socioeconomic challenges facing tribal communities. Um, can you tell us some of the risk factors indigenous, indigenous women face? If it's foster homes, uh, Native Americans are five times more likely to be in foster homes. Can you tell us some of those risk factors? I mean, this is where it can be difficult because we can't narrow down the risk factors to one small area. And I know right now, you know, Black Lives Matter has really shed a light on how we can reform our criminal justice system and maybe defund or remove some of the funding that we give to police. Um, but I think that, you know, in my experience, really my background, I have, I have a degree in ethnic studies from the University of Oregon. So dismantling systems is kind of a, is, a, is a big part of that degree. I was a worker at our Children's Protective Services and had over 800 cases on my caseload. And that is where I would, I would practice court. And so in my opinion, one of the biggest risk factors is the way that our criminal justice systems are set up to be punitive as opposed to trauma informed. And so, you know, you, you can't pick one thing because tribal economies also, you look at timber bills, you look at gaming bills, you look at the roads that have been built for tribes to go economic and they are not sustainable and they do not align with tribal values. That kind of poverty and lack of job growth plays into those risk factors of young women having to be in har harmful relationships. Um, you couple that with the lack of mental health services, you couple that with the criminal justice system that does not serve us, you cripple that with uh, elected representatives who don't understand tribes. There is no one thing to point at, it is everything. Thank you, thank you, uh, Karina. Um, Jessica, in your book, Highway of Tears, you interviewed uh, family members and those closest to the victims. And, and you, Although the, the legal scheme is a little different for First Nations, um, can you tell us a little bit about how law enforcement responded to these uh, indigenous women going missing um, and even the media? What was the media's response uh, to the indigenous women going missing? Um, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so for law enforcement and the media, in many of these cases, there was no response or very little. Um, but to break it down a little bit, with the police, um, 
what many, many, many of the families would say was that, so very little response and a slow response. So for example, in Ayla's story that I talked about, you know, this was a girl who had just turned 14 and had gone missing. And the police told her mother to give it a few days. Um, and then this type of response, and th that that runs through almost every one of these cases. So, you know, uh, there was another girl, Lana Derrick, who was home from college for Thanksgiving weekend and didn't make it home. And when her family went to the police, they said, oh, she's probably shacked up with a boyfriend or out on some bender, you know, give it some time. And this is a 19 year old college student who was due back in class. Uh, so there was those sorts of responses. And then the type of response that they would get was often really demeaning, rude, uncaring. Uh, there's one um, family that when they went to report a 15 year old missing, the cop, after a couple of days of them calling, the police came to the house to take a statement. The officer wouldn't get out of the car. So like the sisters had to stand at the window of the police officer's car trying to give him information. Um, and then when you look at the investigations that did take place once they actually took place, um, like in, in my, when I started on this book, you know, the, the stories from families were pretty consistent about the problems they'd had with the police. But then of course the police just say, we did a great job, but no, you can't see the files. These are open cases, but you know, trust us, we did a great job. Um, so part of the book was investigating the sort of investigations. And what I found was, you know, in some cases the, the police had chalked it off as a runaway. So they didn't do anything for months. There was evidence that was lost or missing. Um, there were notes that were missing. I mean, it, it just, it's sort of stunning. Um, or it's not, but it should be. In the case of Ayla, just to give one more example of this. So she had last been seen, she was at the, the door of a friend's house and she asked her friend's mom for a ride home. And this was the night after she'd been separated from her siblings and her friends at the mall or after the mall. And the friend's mom couldn't drive her, but said, do you want to use the phone to call your mom? She said, no, she was going to do something else. And the police assumed because there was a sort of known drug house across the street, the police had assumed that that's where she'd gone. And so they focused their investigation on that house and who might have been there for years. Uh, and it was something like three or four years later that somebody thought to look for security camera footage uh, from the gas stations that are between her friend's house and her own home. And sure enough, she had been walking home by herself hours after she was last seen. So there were years missed there, um, you know, which may or may not be the, it could have made the case, who knows, but we will never know because it wasn't done until three or four years after the fact. Uh, so that's the police. Um, and then I'll, I'll just very briefly, the other thing with the police in Canada is that, you know, the police, the RCMP, which is sort of the national police force that also has the jurisdiction over many small communities that don't have their own municipal force. The RCMP was a major instrument in, you know, the historical and ongoing genocide in Canada. So the RCMP was formed to clear Indigenous people from the land. Uh, to force them onto reserves, to ensure that they did not leave reserves, to take kids away to residential school, to take kids away to, uh, to foster homes through child welfare systems. Uh, so it's a, and, and then the police is also, you know, behind this incredibly disproportionate incarceration of Indigenous people in the country. So there's, uh, there's not a lot of trust of police forces for very good reason. And, and you know, that hampers investigations as well. Um, so that's the police and then I'll just talk very briefly about the media but I mean it's very similar like not a lot of coverage um if any and then when there is coverage a lot of victim blaming language uh, really inappropriate terminology so you know describing sexually exploited 14 year olds as uh, prostitutes uh describing and almost without fail on the highway of tears girls who are missing or murdered are described as women and th that alone is you know it's might seem to some people like a small thing, but it's not because it's the difference between children and adults. And in, you know, for the public that is is hearing this and forming opinions on it, it makes a big difference. And so 
I mean, there's been a lot of conversation about the media in Canada, how they've done these things, and it has gotten better, but it's still very much ongoing. I mean, I think it was this year or late last year that there was a really well-known case of a murder of a, a girl named Tina Fontaine and the biggest newspaper in Canada, the Globe and Mail, during a court case, because uh, somebody had actually been charged, the the headline, you know, was about like the the young woman had drugs in her system when she was murdered and how that was remotely relevant to the murder charges against a grown man is, you know, beyond me. So we're still seeing that sort of thing happening all the time. A lot of victim blaming. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, th those are some very important points. Um, so, Dr. Harjo, um, you, in in your book chapter, uh, Kitanak, um, and correct my uh, pronunciation of that, you talk about community, uh, community participatory action. Um, so what are some of the Indigenous communities doing in response to uh, murdered, missing Indigenous women and girls? Okay, thank you for that question. So <clears throat> some of the ways that we're seeing this refusal of a damage-based narrative, we see Mady artist um, Christy Belcourt, you, I don't know, you may be familiar with her work, but she did the walking with our sisters um, moccasin installation that traveled across Canada. And she started out, she did a call for 600 moccasin tops. So these moccasins, they're moccasin tops and they represent the unfinished lives of these sisters that are missing or murdered. Um, she got this tremendous response with moccasins coming in from all all over the place and so the way that folks were coming together and carrying this out um they were forming beating groups together in these different geographic spaces so this is what i was talking about when i was talking about these embodied resources that communities have so they were coming together they're creating resources, they're having conversations, but it started out like the beaters were doing it. But then whenever pe people wanted to bring the installation to their community, they raised money, they had like different, um, different positions that people played in bringing the installation. And it actually um, engendered dialogue around missing and murdered indigenous women and sexual violence in their communities that was unprecedented. So men were joining in, there were like different sorts of seminars and workshops and chili cook-offs and whatever, but like there were different ways that community was coming together to have these conversations. But Walking With Our Sisters was really about um, a commemoration of these women that are missing and murdered and the families who have never had a chance to grieve. So this installation enabled them to have the space to, to remember their family members. Um, but in order to bring that, this bundle, which is a bundle of relatives, they treated it like a bundle of relatives. So they had like maybe 20 different roles that people played in the community to organize just to receive this. So somebody to take care of a fire, somebody to welcome it, people to do cooking, people to organize social media, people to raise money, people to lay out the moccasins, people, you know, it was just like an immense sort of response. Just with that, with that one thing with walking with our sisters. Some of the other ways that communities have responded, um, yeah. I was part of a workshop in Southern California with um, strong-hearted women, and we did a we did collage making, and so it was a smaller group, and the women had a chance to, um, you know, I talk about this felt knowledge. It's sort of like you can feel it, but you can't articulate it. So giving folks a platform to articulate what they're feeling. So collage making enabled community members to just come through and start putting pictures on canvas and mod podging it and thinking about what was on their mind. And through the day, there were a series of workshops. Everyone laid out their collage. They had a chance to talk with each other about it. And then we sort of, towards the end of the day, we had a conversation about things that were working, weren't working, and what kind of ideas that they had about 
what needs to happen again uh, around violence against women. And so these activities were sequenced and staged out in a way that really engendered conversation. So the collaging was earlier in the day that sort of primed the pump to sort of surface this felt knowledge and just thinking through it through the day and articulate with each other with sort of like low stakes space enabled them to have a conversation. Because I know like a lot of folks are uncomfortable sitting in a group and then all of a sudden it's like, here's the mic, you say what's on your mind and then they freeze. So like that's sort of, that's sort of my area that I'm always looking at. How do we create the activities and methodologies that folks can speak their piece about their community so that we can understand the landscape of the issue in different spaces because each space is gonna be different because of the geographies, right? So where some are borders with reservations or cities or like in Oklahoma where it's intermingled with uh, informal indigenous communities and cities, everybody has like different dimensions that they have to grapple with around violence against women and children and just their tribal members in general. So those are a few of the ways that communities are, are responding to this issue. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Harjo. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, look at some of our audience's questions. Um, we'll, we'll give Dr. Harjo just a break for a moment. Um, uh, Jessica, one of the questions, uh, it, Jessica's powerful book, High Wave Tears, men mentions that transit was one of the many solutions suggested to address the problems of women and girls hitchhiking between Highway 16 communities due to the lack of current transportation op options. Have any further efforts been made to get transit programs off the ground in the region? And what are some of the current barriers to doing so? And finally, uh, uh, many tribal communities have realized, uh, in America, have realized success in developing trans uh, transit programs. Uh, might there be an opportunity for intercontinental meetings and a dialogue between Native American, Indigenous, Canadian communities on how to get British Columbia inter-community transit programs started within the province. Um, and again, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, so the transportation system, for lack thereof, in that area, it's um, there. There's been a little headway made in the last few years. There's now a bus that connects the communities. Um, but when that, it was sort of interesting because the the provincial government agreed to fund this bus, uh, so you can go from you know one community to the next, which is really important there because many of the communities have you know virtually no services. So if you want to go to the bank or you want to go to the doctor or whatever, uh, now there's a way to do it. But when that bus went in, then Greyhound, which had provided sort of express, like straight through long distance routes, um, pulled out. So there's there's been improvements, but then you know there's still an enormous enormous lack um, for intercommunity travel and also within communities. You know, so Smithers, which is uh, the town where I grew up, which is right in the middle of the Highway of Tears, I think for ever has had two taxis. And now it has zero. Um, so even if you had money for a taxi, you can't get a taxi. Uh, so there are still, you know, enormous, enormous hurdles there. I mean, what the challenges are, I think funding is a huge part of it. Uh, political will is a huge part of it. Um, and, you know, and some municipalities have been doing a lot of work, but it's sort of other municipalities aren't as interested. Uh, many of the First Nations have put together their own transportation services. Um, so bus routes, uh, pick up, drop off sort of services that are run by the communities themselves, which I think are making a huge difference and, and have been really, really effective. Uh, Jessica, you make some important points. And in addition, Dr. Harjo, your uh, points about uh, geography uh, is just amazing. Um, Karina, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with the Warm Springs um, uh, Indian Reservation, the geography? Um, you know, many of our listeners do not understand the infrastructure problems that we have when we're planning for our communities. Um, you know, basic water um, has been an issue, I know, down at Warm Springs. Um, have you guys uh, had infrastructure resource issues? 
as far as mobility and transportation um, down in Warm Springs? So I'm not sure. Um, I know there are probably a lot of people who are tuning in that are unaware, but Warm Springs actually was in its third year of experiencing a lack of drinkable water. This has been an ongoing infrastructure issue and this is just another example of policy not really being intentionally set up to always function for tribes. And so um, what happens is basically over all the years, initially the Bureau of Indian Affairs was responsible for the water infrastructure system. And there are pieces of it from the 20s, 40s, 50s, 60s that have never been updated. And when you saw self-determination come in and some of these things started to shift to tribal government responsibility, there were things that hadn't just been done in so many decades that were still the federal's responsibility. And so what's happening is right now, what has happened is there were huge leaks in the system for years. And when I was elected onto our tribal council, we had a lot of violations from EPA and and we had a very um, wonderful leader, Alyssa Macy, who was our operations officer that kind of pieced together what was going on and identified that there were these huge leakage things. And what happened was because this is where modern tribal government and traditional forms of leadership don't always coexist. As leaders, Chush, Chushiwak Ishwe, water is life. It is the most sacred thing. It is what we start and end with. It is the center of our religion, our beliefs. So it is not appropriate for us to tax our people for this sacred thing. But what that means is that our homes are not metered. That means that the only metering we have is on the water treatment system that treats all of our drinkable water and sends it out. So we weren't able to identify specifically where the issue, where the uh, holes were going, but we were able to identify that we were using the same amount of water as the city of Bend, which is the populations are not comparable. That's because of all the leaks. So then we started to plug the leaks, but that put pressure pressure on the whole rest of the system. So for the last three years, what happens is we've been making these repairs on the water system, but it's been causing pressure on other parts and those are breaking. And that's leaving this entire community without drinkable water for months at a time. Last year it was over three months. This year it was over a month. This balloons out right now, my son, he is almost two years old in the fall. There is no childcare. There's none for three years and under and any and even older kids you have to be an essential worker so you put that on top of all these things we're talking about during a pandemic and our numbers are higher and our chief's wife passed away recently and it's impacting us disproportionately you put all these things together and it's just more examples of that and really what's happening is the state legislature they have um, allocated over three million dollars for this one fix but every year we face an eight million to twelve million dollar fix on the current break so that we can get drinkable water but the overall system fix me 200 million. And what's happening right now is we know this is gonna happen, but every shuff, everyone's shuffling and pointing fingers of who's responsible for this. As a tribal leader, I understand my elders and I respect their decision to not tax our people for water. Capitalism is a colonial concept. And until we start to really understand that and start to separate these policies, only then will tribes be able to create local sustainable economies that are in line with our tribe values but again everything connects and the water infrastructure issue certainly takes precedent and so we don't have sidewalks everywhere we don't have public transportation we don't have enough counseling services we don't have all of these things that can help mitigate some of the violence that takes place for our women we don't even have you know street lights safe walkable areas in this community because we're stuck surviving so that's in a nutshell what has been going on thank you karina um, and that leads to one of our audience participation questions. Um, Dr. Harjo, could you talk a little bit about the urban built structures and urban technologies that support or inhibit the progress towards issues of murdered, missing indigenous women and girls? Could you read that again? Um, so we're talking about uh, the built environment and um, urban structures and how do these urban technologies affect uh, or inhibit the progress towards resolving these issues of murdered missing indigenous women. Karina talked a little bit about the rural area and the lighting, uh, the safety of women and walking. Uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the built environment? Yeah, sure. So from a physical design aspect, one of the, the things that you can think about probably like in an urban environment is 
is how indigenous women and girls have to do a lot of trip chaining in the city. So like they just can't go and, you know, because of, of the, okay, so if you start with the division of labor and they're doing the majority of the labor for the household and the family and they're strapped for time, then they're having to chain a trip, like maybe say to, um, I don't know, like say to the doctor, dropping somebody off at school, picking somebody up at daycare, and you're having to trip chain this, okay? So one of the aspects of this is often um, our indigenous folks, their spatial um, arrangement in the city are often in lower income areas. And a lot of times when folks are doing transportation planning around bus routes and bus stops, it may be hard to find a bus stop that they can do trip chaining on if they're having to um, to take the bus. For example, so I just moved to Oklahoma from Albuquerque, so I'm more kind of familiar with Albuquerque. So with the, the rapid ride, that was one of the controversies is that um, it was going to have more stops that serve folks from affluent areas that were getting off at their job sites than folks that were living in lower income areas. And we see this a lot in urban planning that, um, that folks living in affluent areas don't want bus stops in their, their neighborhoods. So that's kind of one aspect of it. Like when you start thinking about bus routes, um, do they have adequate bus routes to do their trip chaining? Do they have bus stops to do trip chaining as well? Um, some of the other things are around, well, like I know along Central, that's like the major thoroughfare in Albuquerque, there's a lot of street harassment of indigenous women. And I think just indigenous folks in general, because you have a large homeless population around Central, and again, there's this sort of like this dehumanization of indigenous folks along that physical space. So that's the only sort of exposure that folks are getting to indigenous folks as well. But um, in terms of that, that's one aspect. Another aspect is around um, if we look at the city of Winnipeg and how there has been a problem with um, assaults and missing and murdered indigenous women around ground transportation, like taxis and ride sharing services, that's been like a huge problem. And so locally, the um, indigenous community organized ride sharing. So that ride sharing aspect is community driven. So, so folks feel safe, they can, it, maybe they're catching a ride with somebody they know. And that's sort of something folks are already doing anyway. If they don't have a car, they're connecting with relatives or friends or neighbors that they know to catch rides where they need to go. That's one aspect. Um, another aspect that um, when I was teaching a Foundations of Community Planning class, we did an MMIW plan around actually Winnipeg and we worked with Dr. Kiara Laudner out of University of um, Manitoba in Winnipeg as well. But one of the things that came up there is the students, what they did is they identified every single sort of um, indigenous organization in the city of Winnipeg and they mapped it. And then they started looking at clustering. Then they started imagining like, where could a physical corridor be that serves indigenous folks in Winnipeg where they can go and they can have a space of belonging. This is sort of like the physical design aspect. So they start off with mapping and understand that and clustering and seeing like, okay, here's like a corridor that maybe we can work towards. And I know that I brought this up in the past and somebody said, well, aren't you sort of creating like a ghetto? But they weren't indigenous, but if this is the space of belonging that indigenous people are coming to already, this is like they're they've already organically created this corridor. So um, I forgot the name of the street in um, the Twin Cities. It's like an indigenous corridor as well, but it has all sorts of businesses, et cetera. 
but something sort of along those lines, like where can you begin to identify and create uh, sp spaces of belonging and safety within urban areas? And maybe it's creating clusters where you're stacking functions of maybe housing, childcare, banking services that maybe tribes um, develop. I don't know, but that could be like something too so that folks feel safe and have a space of belonging if they're gonna be in urban areas feeling untethered. But yeah, so thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Harjo. Um, we have a large number of questions coming in and uh, we'll not, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I, I want to let you know that we will post some of the, the bills and uh, the, the legislation that was mentioned by the, the Honorable Congresswoman uh, Holland, uh, the Not Invisible Act and Savannah's Act um, are, are two of the acts uh, that was mentioned. Also, we have VAWA Violence Against Women Act that I would encourage you to look at. Um, one of the questions, uh, Jessica, I, I will share, ask you, um, are tribal women warned not to walk alone on area roads where murders have occurred, and then anybody can jump in on that as well. On the Highway of Tears, yes. Um, there's been quite a lot of effort over the years put into don't hitchhike campaigns and billboards. Um, those have been controversial for a couple reasons though. One is that most of the girls and women who've gone missing from the Highway of Tears weren't hitchhiking. Uh, that's a, one of the really, I think, misunderstood things about it. They were trying to go somewhere, but most of them were not out on the highway with their thumb out. And the focus for many years on the hitchhiking part of it was really a sort of a victim blaming thing. And it's certainly in the community, growing up in the community, that's what you would sort of hear was, oh, well, you shouldn't be hitchhiking. Um, so there has been public awareness, but you know, it's also it's it's not so simple as not hitchhiking because hitchhiking is often the only way to get around in in that area. Um, so yes, people have been warned, but until there are alternatives, um, you know, what are you going to do? I remember one story about a woman who was uh, she needed to get her son to an orthodontist, and her only way to get there was to hitchhike or not have him get the you know the dental care that he needed uh one of the missing women on the highway of tears was hitchhiking because she was going to a, a custody hearing for her kids you know so it's it's not really a choice mm. so uh for any of our our participants uh what are some other strategies that we see as important um to help our tribal communities indigenous women um from these uh, violent acts or, or homicide events? I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay. <clears throat> so I think, you know, this is something for me, I grew up in Warm Springs, I grew up in rural Oregon, I grew up in, to be honest, it's a conservative district where my public, public education just upheld colonial norms. And so short term, you know, these kind of um, conversations and just centering like black and indigenous people in all of the work that we're doing is what we can do now. But for longer term, I think, you know, strategically, I'm obviously running for the Senate and I'm looking at what kind of committees do I want to be on. Um, education is the number one committee because it is the way that we are as humans and how we need to humanize each other um, so that our young women and our young people don't have to continue to do that work. And so there's specific things in at least the Oregon legislature, but hopefully that spread um, things like ethnic studies bills things like tribal curriculum bills so that we're not having to do this work organizing as adults, but we're thinking long-term and strategically, not only how do we protect Native women from violence, but how do we actually change how our society understands it and who has the privilege of telling stories and what information do we understand and what viewpoint do we understand it from? Because like I said, you know, this is across the board that I'm sure each of us could spend a whole couple hours just talking about the work that has been done to identify these issues. But if you just go back to who were the founding fathers, what were their actions, what were they like, what were their intentions of writing a lot of this, it wasn't for us to live. Kill the Indian, save the man. And when are we going to fully acknowledge that and acknowledge all of the microways and the macroways that it exists in our policy today? We can only you know, put our, we can do our work, but I always put our faith in the youth. 
And education, I think, is where it lies in supporting that kind of long-term thinking. Thank you. Um, and I encourage our audience, uh, there's a very good report from the Seattle Urban Indian Health uh, Institute um, that looks at not only um, urban indigenous women that are going missing and, and the violence, direct act of violence, looking at law enforcement response, media response, um, that you look at that report. Um, there are women that go missing, uh, not only in Indian country on the reservations, but also in our urban core and how we can look to assist those women. Um, we're wrapping up with our final uh, few minutes uh, before uh, Ian comes back on. Um, do any of our panelists have some uh, specific comments that they would like to share um, as we begin to wrap up our conversation here today? Yeah, I guess I'll throw, uh, throw a few things out there. Um, so I know like with missing and murdered indigenous women, you know, I feel like um, on the legal side, I sort of feel like we have um, we have a huge effort around that, and and it makes me feel confident about the folks working on that. Um, and I guess from a community planning perspective, um, like the thing that I would say of what folks can do is first really recognizing our relationships to one another because um, it's sort of like we always talk about well these women walked alone or these women hitchhiked or these women did that but like what about changing and thinking about the folks that are actually carrying out these acts you know and like how can we begin to reshape our relationships to one another in our communities as well. And so um, that's something that I call radical sovereignty or stajati sovereignty. And it's like, how do we begin to change our relationship to one another and build from there? And the second thing is once we begin to build that relationality to one another and um, more than human entities as well, flora, fauna, et cetera, then how can we begin to surface that community knowledge? That's what I was talking about. Like, how can we begin to understand the landscape of this situation? So like, if you're sitting with kids and you're like, well, how do you feel? Because I remember my, my daughter being in school in Tahlequah, Oklahoma at Cherokee Elementary, which I went there too when I was a kid and they had a Cherokee Brave it was called Cherokee Braves. They had a little mascot with the pot belly and a vest with the tomahawk. And it was like a cartoon. And I remember my daughter saying like, she didn't like that. It made her feel bad. And she was like kindergarten, first grade. And we had a meeting about it with the parent committee or whatever. And there were folks in there that were so tied to that mascot. It didn't matter to them that it was making like these indigenous kids feel bad, but the ones that were speaking like really hard on its behalf were white passing native folks who were unbothered by it. They had the ethnic option to either say that they're white now or like I'm indigenous now and I say that I don't have a problem with this mascot. So um, that kind of felt knowledge and community knowledge, even understanding it from the kids and how that makes them feel and figuring out ways to understand what's going on in the landscape of the community. Then once you're building relationships, understanding what people need, then coming together and figuring out what, what it is that we can plan to do in our communities. And then you understand what scale it needs to happen at, like local, regional, federal, et cetera. That's the plan, that's the planning aspect. And so I would like, off, I would offer that up is like, how do we carry that aspect out in the community to the informal aspect of community? Because I feel like we have the juridical aspect kind of covered, but like this community kind of informal, like, like working on that as well. So that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, so that is about our time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Ian, but all of our audience today, there's something you can do in your communities, in, in transportation, you can support 
uh, the, the uh, Congresswoman's bills. We, we have uh, Savannah's Act, not Invisible Act, and understanding that there is this complicated jurisdictional issue that makes transportation and having safe and walk communities very difficult. Ian, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Margot, and thanks to all the panelists. Please keep your cameras on uh, just for our last uh, uh, few minutes here. Um, this has been a tremendous discussion, and uh, at America Walks, we're really grateful to you, Margot, for putting this incredible panel together, to Congresswoman Harland, uh, who had to leave a little early, uh, to you, Professor Harjo, and to Karina Miller and Jessica McDiarmid for all the passion that you put into your work and for sharing your work with our audience today. Uh, it's been very educational, very informative for me and uh, over 500 uh, participants that were on the webinar at the peak and we're still at about 400 now. Um, I do wanna give a final uh, shout out to our sponsors who generously support our webinar series and also mention that the sponsorship does not fully cover uh, the work and costs involved in, in putting together uh, these webinars and we do welcome uh, donations uh, and Kelsey is putting the link for donations in the chat so uh, if you feel so moved please feel free to click that link and uh, and, and make a donation to America Walks. Um, our next two webinars are coming up in uh, early and mid-September. Uh, Tuesday September the 8th at 10 a.m. Pacific 1 p.m. Eastern we have right away race right of way, race, class, and the silent epidemic of pedestrian deaths in America. This is a book discussion uh, with author Angie Schmidt, uh, interviewed by America Walks board member, Charles Brown. And then um, just over a week after that, Wednesday, September 16th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, Youth Leading the Way, Inspiring Stories of Youth Creating Safe, Accessible Neighborhoods. So we look forward to seeing you again in September. Once again, thanks very much to our panelists and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Bye.